The Jagdtiger, meaning hunting tiger in German, was the heaviest tank deployed in World War II, by any of the nations involved. This colossal machine, armed with some of the heaviest armour and arguably the most powerful cannon produced in World War II, was to be a tank smashing machine, but all did not go as planned. So let's take a further look into this beast. The concept for the Jagdtiger originally was formed in 1942 with the German army wanting the massive 128mm cannon it's wielding to be fitted on a mobile chassis. At first this was not specifically for anti-tank use, but a huge assault gun designed to spot the infantry against enemy heavy fortified positions and blast them into pieces. So March 1943 rolled around, and it was decided that the 128mm would be either be mounted on a Panther or Tiger II chassis, that was the same chassis used for the King Tiger. But once the wooden mock-ups had been produced, it was clear the Panther wouldn't be able to hold such a gun, and the Tiger II chassis was chosen. Even so, this still had to be enlarged, as a 12.8cm gun was such a monster, it took an insane amount of internal space up. The production of the Jagdtiger was erratic. Even for German super heavies, this one took the biscuit. Multiple designs were put together, but even so, massive amounts of adjustments and modifications had to be done. The chassis had to be made larger both lengthways and in width, but it had to be careful not to make it too large, or it not be able to be transported by rail. Then the requirements were added for a fully removable casemate to make maintenance easier, as the Germans had learned from the Tiger One and King Tiger through the nightmare of having to remove the turret to access the engine or the transmission fully. But even with the fully removable casemate, the gun still blocked access and would also have to be removed to make full repairs. I think everyone on the design team knew this was going to be a maintenance heavy monster, but when the right demanded the super heavy, one had to be delivered. And finally, by September 1943, the wooden mock ups of the production variant were ready. And theoretically, Jag Tigers could now start rolling off the line. So the production was all set, and by June 1944, a whopping one had been completed. The production was a mess, with multiple vehicles having the now unused Porsche suspension, and many of the hulls having to have up to 40mm of armour grinded off them to get the internal components to fit, and many smaller changes being demanded by the army, further making production slow. Due to these issues, a planned 150 vehicles would be produced, and after that, the factory would switch back to the production of Panther tanks. Even with considerable resources, and Hitler himself once again stepping in and demanding the production of the Jagdtiger to be continued, and even for the complete hulls to be fitted with the 8.8cm gun of the King Tiger, due to the shortage of the 128mm gun, only 74 of the Jagdtigers were completed by the war's end, just enough to arm around three companies with said tanks, but far less than that had been hoped for. Even with all these issues, the Jagd had one thing going for it. The mighty tank shattering 12.8cm Pac-44 L55. This insane weapon was the most powerful anti-tank gun of World War II, with it actually being tested against the Soviet I-7 prototype to see if its armour was tough as promised. The 128mm had an insane level of penetration. When the ideal ammunition was available, it could penetrate 202mm at 1km away, meaning it could knock out an I-2 with ease. And even at 2 kilometers away, it could penetrate 178 millimeters of armor, meaning it could still knock out the IS-2. This was an insanely potent anti-tank gun, but not without its flaws. It used two-part ammunition, which meant it was only capable of firing around three rounds per minute. But this ammunition did allow more to be stored, with around 40 rounds of high explosives and armor-piercing rounds to be stored inside the Agtiga. Even though the 128 millimeter delivered great firepower, it also had some other flaws, such as lacking a muzzle break which would have helped reduce the massive recoil of this gun. This was deliberately left off as special high-velocity shells with a sub-caliber core, which were travelling at immense speed, were able to penetrate an estimated 245mm of armour at 30 degrees at around 1km away, were designed for this gun, but they never actually entered full production, meaning the muzzle brake was left off for no reason at all, which is absolutely insane, to be honest. And due to the size of the gun, it had to be fixed during travel, or the vibrations from moving could damage the gun and knock the sights off alignment, meaning every time the vehicle travelled, the crews had to reline the sights and recalibrate the guns, which was a nightmare, and not something you want during intense combat situations with little time in between combat. The Agtiga did have some secondary armaments though, in the form of a Hull MG42 machine gun for dealing with close range infantry assaults, and also an MG34 could be pinned or mounted on the back deck of the Jagdtiger for use against light anti-aircraft attacks. This was obviously not that effective at uh, stopping aircraft, but it was more to deter close air support. The crew inside the Jagdtiger also carried MP38 or MP40 machine guns, as well as pistols when they were available. 
and grenades, but due to the limited vision around the Agtiger, and the hatches not being located well for anti-infantry defences, th throwing them was a blind man's gambit most of the time. One great advantage was due to the immense size and height of the Agtiga, enemy troops would have to make a real effort to climb the tank, which was a small saving grace. The armour of the Agtiga was extremely thick, with it originally being planned as an assault gun, it was expected to face enemy strong points, so it needed to be able to take huge amounts of fire and shrug it off, while it crawled forward and demolished enemy positions. The armour specifics of the Agtiga are a 250mm thick on the front of the casemate, 150mm thick on the glacis, and 150 millimeters thick on the lower front. The forward part of the hull had a 50 millimeter thick roof, although the rest of the roof over the casemate was 40 millimeters thick. Of note here is the roof of the casemate was not welded into place like the roof of the Tiger or the Tiger 2, but was actually bolted on to the superstructure. The lower hull sides were 80 millimeters thick, and so were the upper hull sides, but these were also sloped inwards at 25 degrees, affording the crews inside a good deal of protection for enemy fire, as long as they remained facing the enemy. But even the rear of the Agtiga had an 80mm thick plate, including a pair of large gas-tight doors at the back. The thinnest parts of the armour were under the sponsors over the tracks, which were just 25mm thick, and under the engine, which was also 25mm thick. The forward part of the lower hull was 40mm thick, providing good protection for the crews from mines and light explosives that might be thrown under the tank. The armour, unlike many other German tanks, was not face hardened but actually rolled homogeneous plate. It took a six man crew to man this 72 ton monster, with the crew positions being as follows a driver, a radio operator who also handled the MG 34 machine gun in the hull, both of these located to the front of the tank, and the remaining four crew in the casemate, a commander, a gunner, and two loaders, as the massive two part ammunition was a big job to load into the actual gun. These, these crews were rushed through training as both the eastern and western fronts began to buckle and was further pushed back into German territory. This meant not only did the crews get little to no training sometimes before manning the Jagdtagers, some were even sent to the Nubligen works, being told helping to produce the Jagdtagers would help familiarise them with the tanks. But in reality, they were short on manpower, and many cases across Germany, panzer crews were building tanks in the factories instead of crewing them on the front lines. The Ag Tiger's mobility wasn't good, with it being based off the King Tiger chassis, but being 10 tons heavier, so every gear, wheel and bolt was under immense pressure, with the beast struggling to move on a good day. Even with this immense strain, it could achieve around 38 km an hour on roads, around 12 to 15 off-road, but would struggle massively with difficult terrain, with several Ag Tigers getting stuck in bomb craters, and as you can guess, the reliability was awful. They simply weighed too much, putting too much pressure on the tank, with the major production setbacks, by the time they were ready to be deployed to combat, very little testing and real combat experience was available for the Agtiga, meaning a lot of the issues and kinks could not be sorted out, which led to many simply breaking down before engaging the Allies in battle. But the key question is, how did the Agtiga perform when in combat? Well, as you can tell with the issues with the reliability and the sheer weight of these tanks, this meant that getting to the battlefield itself was no easy task, requiring special train carriages with running gear to suit. And even when loaded due to the state of the war for Germany by late 1944, the Allies had absolute air superiority, meaning rail lines were being destroyed and long distance transport for heavy panzer became almost non-existent. And in some cases, these tanks would be destroyed whilst being transported by rail. When the Ag Tigers did get to the battlefield, there was still the task of keeping them working until in range of the enemy. This also didn't go so well as the average two thirds being in state of repair, meaning most companies armed with the Ag Tigers were chronically under strength limiting their operational capacity. There was also the fact that the German military was in a state of panic and morale was at an all-time low. So when operations did occur, infantry and artillery support was very rare. With the fact that the Ag Tiger was basically a super heavy assault gun, it needs to be used in combined arms force for it to truly be effective. The first shot at an enemy officially fired by the Ag Tiger was on New Year's Eve 1944, when three Ag Tigers of Panzer Auto 653 were joined with other German forces in the southern Schwiegen Chemsee area of Germany, where it saw sporadic fighting with US forces. But the Jag Tiger wasn't in ideal terrain or position to be put to good use, and more tanks were being used in this area over the next few months, but due to poor maintenance and lack of sufficient repair facilities hampered any true use of these Jag Tiger forces. One engagement which was successful for the Jag Tiger was when two Jag Tigers rolled towards the German town of Oenheim on the 17th of January, in support of infantry forces and engaged a bunker at a range of over one kilometer away, completely neutralizing it. 
at which point the US forces counterattacked with multiple shown tanks, with one being shattered by the intense barrage being laid down by the Eggtigers, at which point both sides disengaged, with both sides not possessing enough force to push either from their positions. But even through the late stages of the war, there were very few actual combats for the Eggtigers, with so many being out for repairs or just sabotaged by their crews due to the lack of maintenance support or the encroaching Allied forces. This really showed the weaknesses of fielding super heavy tanks with their immense strain on the infrastructure and logistics of a nation. And ultimately, it showed that the German obsession with heavier, bigger and heavily armoured tanks was massively flawed. And the fact that these had access to such tank killers like the National and Jag Panther showed that they had capable and effective tank destroyers available, and the extra weight and maintenance on it that the Jag Tiger added for the sake of the 128mm gun really was not worth the price in the terms of time and resources and the lack of return of this tank really showed this. But even with these failings, it still showed interesting and useful technologies, improvements, and that the Agtiga implemented some of them well, and it did help advance tank technology, especially high caliber guns. It also resulted in one of the most badass vehicles in history, and I've actually had the pleasure of seeing it myself at the Bovington Tank Museum, and it really is awe-inspiring. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something. Thanks for watching everyone, and you guys have a fantastic day.